Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, just to, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Islamic Society again, because much of their hosts with us all day. Uh, they spent a lot of time with us, they fed us, and much of them incredibly good hosts. So, Jazakallah khair for that. So, my talk really is going to be very brief. We, we deliberately kept the talks brief because we wanted to do as much QA as possible, because I think that's when generally the most interesting parts of the um, this discussion tend to take hold. Uh, and so they just go through some very simple things, much of it I'm sure most of you will be aware of. Um, why, why do we believe that the Qur'an is the uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from God? Now obviously for the Arabs at the time, um, many of the things that we've discovered uh, lately in the last century, two centuries or whatever, they were completely unaware of. So those aspects that I'm going to look at today uh, are not the aspects, perhaps, that were looked at by the Arabs at that time. You know, just to continue a little bit on what Imam was saying as well, you know, if today your neighbor said to you, I'm a messenger of God, follow me, give up all of this lifestyle that you're used to, I want you to do all of this, you would probably tell him to go and uh, get his head examined. So clearly there was something that the Prophet came with that convinced the Arabs of that time that this was not a, a liar, he was not a liar, and that the, the words that he was bringing were not his words. And so for them, the Arabic language and the, uh, the rhetoric, the poetry, and the linguistic mastery was their forte. At the time of Moses, Musa alayhi salam, it was magicians, magic. And so when Moses came, uh, peace be upon him, he showed the miracles that defeated the magicians of that time. When it was Isa um, uh, alayhi Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, it was about health and, 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 and medicine. And so he brought people back from the dead. So they all had a miracle to convince their people at that time that they could relate with. And at the time of Prophet Muhammad it was Arabic. It was the language, it was the rhetoric, it was the poetry, it was the mastery of that language, and they were great masters at that time. When the Quran comes down, the Arabic language, the standard became the Quran, despite their excellence of rhetoric and poetry and language and their skills, they realized immediately that these were not the words of any human being. And that might sound unusual, especially to those who are not aware of, of, the, of the Arabic language, and especially the Arabic within the Qur'an. So they got their best poets to go and find out where he's getting his words from. This is like nothing that we've ever heard before. So they tried and they tried and they tried, and the only thing that they could come up with, it is sorcery, it is magic. And without knowing, they accepted that this was not from any human capacity, capability, but in fact came from some supernatural source because they recognized these were not the words of Muhammad, these were not the words of any man, the complexity, the beauty, the structure, the, the way that the Arabic principles of grammar, everything got turned on its head. This man had almost come with a new language. To them. So for us as Muslims, obviously we believe that the Quran is the literal word of God, revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as Iman stated, by uh, Jibreel salam, the angel Gabriel. And we know that it was revealed over 23 years, from the age of 40 to the age of 63, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Just to run through some little trivia, 114 chapters, consisting of 6,236 verses. I I'd like you to just remember <coughs> those two uh, 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 those two snippets of information. 114 chapters, 6,236 verses. Now, the way that the Qur'an was revealed was often in response to an incident uh, that arose at that time. And sometimes the Prophet, peace be would put his head down and he would get wahi, he would get the revelation there and then, why the incident literally unfolded in front of his eyes. In fact, sometimes it was preemptive. So we learn there was a long caravan coming back uh, from, a, from, a, from a conflict, 
and there were Munafik, the Munafik, the Muslim, the hypocrites used to hang around right at the back of the caravan. And they were saying bad things about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. One of the Muslims heard them and he said, I'm going to inform the Prophet of what you've just said. <coughs> so the Munafik, the hypocrite, rushes with his camel to the front and tries to inform the Prophet that we weren't saying this, this is not true. By that time, the Prophet's head was already down and Quran was already being revealed in relation to that very same incident. And as the Munafiq, as the hypocrite said the line in terms of or the, um, uh, the excuse that he gave, that we were not saying this, we're not, that the wahi, the, the Quran was exactly mirroring what he was saying whilst he was saying it. So it was an immediate thing. And then, of course, it was sometimes in relation to a question that what the Prophet may have been asked. Sometimes the answer would come immediately, right there and there, and sometimes it would come after a short period of time. And then thirdly, it was just pu purely because of guidance, an issue of guidance. Now, it's important to remember that, because when you have something revealed, when it's instantaneous, or whether, it, whether it's something in relation to something that's happening, it's very difficult to control that. You can't control, you don't know what's going to happen. So how would you plan in ahead if this happens, I'm going to say this. Very difficult to do that. Primarily, it was passed through the companions orally and it was memorized as its primary source of preservation. And now that might seem unusual, especially in the West, because generally wherever things are related to memory, there's potentially a lot of issues that could happen with that. Um, and if you have it in written form, it's regarded as something that would be perhaps more reliable. But it was also written down at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. We have, uh, you know, in the Hadith, we have scribes who are mentioned, like Zayn bin Thabit, who was the neighbor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi who, who told us that every time when he came, revelation came, the Prophet would call for me and tell me to write it down. Now the two aspects I'm going to look at very briefly inshallah today are the linguistic patterns within the Qur'an and some of the numerical balances and patterns that we find within the Qur'an as well. And again I want to keep it very basic, very brief, so inshallah we can do much of what we're going to do today uh, as questions and answers, because I think that's where things generally get more interesting. Now the person that I'm going to look at here today, and he's not exclusively the person who's looked at these things, but he wrote a book fairly recently, um, and his name is he's a, a associate professor Raymond Farin. Some of you might be aware of his work, and he basically structured he, he studied the, the structural elements of text within the Quran, and he wanted to to see whether there was any coherent pattern that could come across from, from studying the Qur'an. <coughs> and what he found was that he found parallelism, chiasm, and concentric patterns within the Qur'an. Now, as you can see, parallelism, if you have, say, four verses, for example, the verse A, the first verse, would be related here to the third verse, and the second verse would be related to the fourth verse. If you have chiasm, it's more like a mirror in between. So whatever text you have on one side, to the other side, it mirrors, it's connected. And this relationship continues with a, a slight deviation with concentric patterns, where you have a central theme in the middle that sort of ties everything together. Now surprisingly, when he first looked at the Quran, he wasn't a Muslim. And when he studied these patterns within the Qur'an, without anybody propagating Islam to him and giving him da'wah, an invitation to accept Islam, he ends up accepting Islam on the basis that these patterns that he found were so complex that it was impossible uh, without an editorial process and a computer to be able to construct these patterns. Because often these patterns were, so with concentrism, which is the most common pattern that he found within the Qur'an, he found that this ring formation, often you found ring within ring within ring. It became incredibly complex. And as I explained to you, the Qur'an was recorded 
uh, spread orally, and it was a uh, primary way of preservation was uh, through memory. So it'd be very, very difficult. And also going back to the fact in terms of how the Quran was revealed in relation to incidents happening randomly, uh, questions being asked randomly, and of course, just guidance coming down, very difficult to justify how you could have those very, very complex rings uh, formed uh, 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 just by accident or just by chance. And the fact that they're so complex, it makes it, in his view, near enough impossible that this could have just been done via memory or the constructs, the capability, the capacity of any human being or any group of human beings. The second aspect of the Qur'an that I'd like to look at very briefly again is the numerical concepts within the Qur'an. Now there are many facets to the Qur'an, I believe, uh, that support the validity of the Qur'an. Obviously, these things were not known at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now it would be wrong for me to say that Allah placed these things in here because later, many, many centuries later, mathematics and science would become very, very important in society. Uh, and that is why Allah did it. Uh, as a layman, I can't make that claim. But what, uh, what I can say is the fact that today we do have a, a, reli a, a reliable source of, of, of truth, of evidence, through mathematics, through science. And I think that these things do certainly pose some very, very important questions as to how they took place. How did they happen? So some of you might be aware of a lot of these things because they're quite often commonly referred to, but you have the word day, singular, yom, in the Qur'an, exactly 365 times, randomly scattered over the scripture. You have ayam, the plural, which is 30 times. You have the month, which is mentioned 12 times. You have world, dunya, which is mentioned 115 times, and the akhirah, as most Muslims know, we often refer to dunya and akhirah. As, as sort of opposites almost. And they're both mentioned 115 times. The seven heavens are mentioned seven times. The creation of the heavens are mentioned seven times. Now, if you're answering questions, you're dealing with issues that are arising, and you're receiving revelation in that way, who's doing all the counting? How do you make sure that these things are all gonna be balanced? It's a near enough impossible task to do. We have some other examples here, faith and paradise and hell, Satan and angels. Again, there's a balance between these things. And yet over a 600 page plus book, they are scattered all over the Quran. You don't just find them in one chapter or two chapters. So you could say, well, it's easy to do the counting if you have them all in one place. One of the interesting things I also learned was about the ratio of land and sea. The Quran mentions land exactly 13 times and sea 32 times. Now the ratio of that is pretty much down to three decimal places to what the ratio of land and sea is in the world today that we find. Who, who was doing that calculation? Did that also just happen by chance? And, and believe me, I've just skimmed this, the surface here. Those of you who've probably studied these things, you know that there's so much more in the Qur'an referring to uh, this type of balance that Allah has, has created in the Qur'an. And again, I refer back to how the Qur'an was revealed. And that's what makes it extraordinary. No editorial process. Even today, if you go to places like Mauritania in, in, in Africa, the, the, the scholar... The, uh, the, the Imam will write a verse of the Qur'an on the blackboard and the students, because they can't afford books, will have a slate and they will write that verse down with a chalk and they will memorize that verse and the next day they will rub out that verse and they will have another verse or another group of verses and the children will memorize the Qur'an. You go to Mauritania and you ask them, and this is since the Prophet, the Prophet Wasallam, so Islam spread into Africa, into Europe within a century. You go and ask them to recite the Quran, it's exactly the same Quran your Imam will recite here today. And yet you still find all of these things in there. Many other interesting things as well in the Quran. So Allah mentions the similitude of Jesus 
uh, to Adam. In other words, don't call Jesus the Son of God just because he was born without a father, because we created Adam for neither mother nor father as well. So that similitude, that comparison is given of the two. And they're both mentioned equally 25 times in the Quran. Again, Allah has created that balance. The interesting thing is that when they when the similitude is me mentioned, when the similitude is mentioned, sorry, in chapter 3, verse 59, at that point, despite being mentioned on at different places in the chapters before, they're mentioned exactly seven times. So who, who's balancing these things out? Is it conceivable that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sat down and thought, you know what? When I relay this Quran, answer these questions, and refer to these incidents, I've got to make sure all of this actually matches up. Because centuries later, they'll have these things called computers where they can put things into databases and do all this analysis. Is that reasonable? I don't think it is. One of the last uh, comparisons I'm going to make here, um, or, or, or mathematical or, or, or numerical incidents that we find in the Quran, uh, is another one that I think is a very, very a good example to, to, to reflect upon. So as I mentioned, the Quran has 114 chapters. Half of the chapters end in even verses and half of them end, end in odd verses. Now obviously if you go through probability, that's what you would expect. However, if you flip a coin 114 times, it doesn't always come out exactly half. You often have to repeat that experiment many thousands of times or tens of thousands of times before it sort of comes close to 50-50. But in any case, 114 chapters, half ending in even, half ending in, in odd. If you make two columns with the chapter numbers running down one side from 1 to 114, and another column next to it with all the verses, uh, all the verse numbers next to it, then something very interesting is found uh, when you do some simple calculations. So, for example, if you just take, if you add the verse, the chapter numbers to their corresponding verse numbers, you get obviously 114 results. You expect to get half odd and even since you've already got that before. But if you just take the even number results, I told you to remember that figure of how many verses there were in the Quran, it comes to exactly 6,236 verses. Who was doing the counting there? Who was making sure that it was balanced out there? And if you take the odd verses, or all the, sorry, all the odd results and add them together, they add to exactly the sum of all the chapters in the Quran. 6,555. Now again, did this happen by chance or was this orchestrated? There are only three variables. One, that it just happened by chance. The other, that this was orchestrated deliberately by someone or some people to, to make sure that in the future, when people uncover these things, that they will be very surprised, they'll be very shocked. I think chance really is, especially even though I've just skimmed the surface and there are many more examples, I think the probability, sensible probability of it being chance, I think is so remote that I think you can discard it. Then the next stage is, or the next assumption could be that somebody or some people deliberately did this. But when we look at how the Quran was revealed, I can't see how you can truthfully come to that conclusion. And the important thing I think to remember here is this, that it's not just these things that we rely upon or we look at that we find interesting, but there are so many other things I have not obviously had time to discuss about the Arabic language, about the complexity of it, the grammar, the historical accuracy. So many times the Quran reveals things that are contradictory to historical knowledge at the time. One of those, for example, would be where the, uh, the ship or the boat of Noah. In the Bible, it says Ararat, mountain Ararat. The Prophet ﷺ in the Quran relays, Allah relays to him, Mount Judi. Today, if you go and investigate, 
They found an outline at 13,500 feet of a structure that resembles a ship or a boat on the Mount Juli in Turkey. But how did the Prophet Muhammad know that? Why was he going against convention at the time if, the, if, if he just wanted to persuade people, fool them into believing his religion? Why, why counter, why, somebody, somebody say, why contradict it? Because when you contradict somebody else's belief, they're less likely to accept what you have to say. But that's exactly what the Quran does over and over again. The Bible refers to the Pharaonic dynasty and the dynasties that came before that as pharaohs, pharaohs, pharaohs. The Quran refers to certain dynasties as king and certain dynasties as Pharaoh. pharaoh, pharaoh. Now, historically, we find out that was actually correct because the Pharaonic dynasty started when the Quran has actually said it started and not before. So historically, it was correct, whilst others around were making mistakes. So, as I said, it's the frequency and the complexity, just finding a pattern. I've, I've read some of the rebuttals because obviously I wanted to make sure I read some of the rebuttals of people who, about the numerical miracles of the Quran. And they come up with Moby Dick or they come up with Shakespeare. They say, oh, if you do an analysis, there's some words here that matter. It doesn't make it from God. I, I accept that. Finding a pattern is not and does not necessitate that it came from God. It's the frequency and the complexity of those patterns that become compelling. That, do, that they become compelling. And so when we look at that, the frequency and the complexity, I think there's only one sensible solution, a sensible conclusion rather, that you can come to. This is not deception. This is not orchestrated by any human capacity. It has to have come from something far higher than that. Now, inshallah, I'll hand it back to Brother Hamza, who will uh, do one of his favorite uh, freestyle. Freestyle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.